so nice. So um, Mr. Afik here, uh, he will be presenting uh, titled um, uh, Pulsars, Incredible Physics from Incredible Stars. So um, I think I, I'll give the screen to you, Afik, to introduce yourself, what you're doing, and then uh, you can go straight to your presentation. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to start, and uh, I, I didn't really practice, so I don't know if I'm going over time or uh, below time. Um, Assalamualaikum dan apa kabar semua? Uh, kia ora and good evening from New Zealand. My name is Afik Abdul Hamid and I'm originally from Putrajaya, Cyberjaya area, but I'm currently doing my master's research in radio astrophysics at the Institute of Radio Astronomy and Space Research at Auckland University of Technology. And my area of research is pulsars and using pulsars as a way to map the interstellar medium of our galaxy. And I was inspired to do astronomy because when I was younger, I read Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And uh, after that, I realized there was nothing else I wanted to do with my life other than to do astronomy. So for all the young people out there who want to get inspired, I highly recommend reading Cosmos by Carl Sagan. So I'm gonna start now. This is me next to the 30 meter uh, DISH radio telescope at Warkworth Radio Astronomical Observatory in New Zealand. It was originally a satellite ground control station owned by a New Zealand telecom company before it was leased to the university and converted to a radio telescope. And fun fact, actually, whenever SpaceX has a payload delivery mission to orbit, this instrument is actually used for positional tracking and relaying of telemetry data of the spacecraft to the mission control in uh, Hawthorne, California. And we take contracts for that. It's an essential service that we provide to keep the lights on at the Institute. Uh, satellites are an important part of today's uh, event, so I just want to make that little comment. So today's presentation is Pulsars, the incredible physics of incredible stars. And um, I parked myself under the space and art category, and I hope to also show you some of mo the more beautiful and artful aspects of pulsar astronomy. So at this point, you might be wondering, what is a pulsar? And I have this little animation for you guys. Um, I hope we can play. So uh, pulsars are neutron stars that appear at the end of the stellar life cycles. When a star 10 to 20 times more massive than our sun dies, it explodes as a supernova and it leaves behind this small rotating core that emits beams of radio waves that sweep across our field of view. And we can detect these beams using radio telescopes uh, because they appear to us like flashes of light uh, every time the beam sweeps across our line of sight. So uh, you can see here when it sweeps across, there's a little spike there. And it's almost like a lighthouse and pulsars are thought of as the cosmic lighthouses. And they were discovered in 1967 by British radio astronomers, Jocelyn Bell and Anthony Hewish. And they've been a mystery ever since. So um, this is static image of a pulsar. And um, they are incredible astrophysical laboratories because they play host to conditions that cannot be studied, they're impossible to study on Earth. So imagine a star that is like three times the mass of the sun, but with a radius 10 kilometers across. So the star the size of a city, but with more mass in it than the entire solar system. And because they're so massive and densely packed, they have very strong gravitational pull. The strength of the gravity of a pulsar is billions of times stronger than that of our planet. And because of magnetic flux conservation, the pulsar magnetic fields are billions of times stronger than our planet. I'm saying billions here because astronomy is often associated with billions and billions. And fun fact, if you put a pulsar at 40 astronomical units away from our solar system, that's 40 times the distance between Earth and the sun, you can actually wipe out every hard disk on our planet. So how do you like that for an end of the world scenario? So as I mentioned, um, Pulsars are born from the death of massive stars. And uh, it's often said that massive stars live like rock stars. They, they live fast, they die young within a few several million years, and they leave, they leave behind beautiful corpses. And some of the famous, most famous astronomical images are of the afterglow from the birth of pulsars. And I'd like to show you, share with everyone uh, some of those images. So this is the Crab Nebula and oops. Yeah, this is the Crab Nebula, and it's one of the brightest objects in the X-ray and gamma rays. It was the first historical observation of a supernova uh, ever associated with the occurrence of a supernova 
ever made by mankind. And it, at the heart of this image is a pulsar that is very energetic and that releases a wind of charged particles that drives the brightness of this image. That's the reason why the crab is so bright. And the supernova that produced this crab nebula was first seen in the year 1054 by Chinese astronomers uh, as a guest star that for a while, it was the brightest thing in the sky next to the sun and the moon. So when this thing lit up, it was there. <laughs> this is the crab nebula, crab pulsar. The next one is the, I'd like to share Vila. It's a very nice name. Uh, it's a relatively nearby pulsar. I think it's more than 500 light years, 800 light years. But um, what's interesting is that you see, can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. shells surrounding the central pulsar. And um, that's known as the pulsar wind nebula. There's actually an animation here, yeah. So, uh, and this is, this shell, this shock wave here is produced by that stream of charged particles when uh, the particles collide with the surrounding diffuse interstellar medium. Uh, it creates sort of like a shock wave, uh, it's the same way that a, how a boat plows through the ocean and creates bow waves. The pulsar creates shock waves as they move through space. And in this animation, we can actually see the, the jet of particles released by the pulsar. So yeah, uh, pulsars are quite amazing astronomical objects. There really is nothing else quite like them, nothing else quite as mysterious, except for, of course, for black holes, which are even more <laughs> insane. Um, yeah, but I won't talk about black holes here. Uh, now, when pulsars were first discovered, yeah, when pulsars were first discovered, they were detected as periodic signals that repeated every 1.33 seconds. And different pulsars have different periods depending on the age of the pulsar. And um, frequency is one over period, right? And some smart human beings out there were able to apply some data sonification to the repeating pulses of the Pulsar, and you, you get something that sounds like this. I'm going to try my... Can you guys hear that? Yeah, so that's like the rotational... the signal of the pulsar. Oops. And uh, like I said, they, they have different frequencies. So this one sounds a bit more... Now, when a pulsar is newly born from the supernova of a massive star, it's much more rapidly rotating. That means it has a shorter period and a much higher spin frequency. And eventually, over time, over billions of years, this rotational frequency will slow down to eventually a point where the pulsar will just stop rotating. It'll stop emitting its beams, and that's the point where it becomes uh, an ordinary quiescent neutron star somewhere out there in the universe. Now, there's a special type of pulsar that can be reborn, that, that, that can avoid this fate of becoming a quiescent neutron star by like cannibalizing, devouring a companion star and getting spun up to become a millisecond pulsar. And millisecond pulsars are very special because their rotational frequencies are incredible. They, they rotate very rapidly within once every two to three milliseconds. Their sounds uh, are almost like a single tone. in the first ones but the second the these are and uh it almost sounds like a musical note and that's because the, the frequency almost approximates a musical tone so i've highlighted this pulsar right here j0437 minus 4715 because that's actually the pulsar that i'm doing my research on it's a millisecond pulsar a special type of pulsar that i will elaborate on more later so this is kind of like more of the artsy aspect. Now, don't get me wrong, pulsars don't actually make sounds. <laughs> Some people like to think of radio astronomy as like listening for sounds from outer space, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. We get these sounds by ascribing some uh, amplitude to the strength of the detected mm -hmm. flux captured uh, pulsar radiation at the telescope. So it's still just light rays, but at longer wavelength, shorter frequencies. Uh, but this is, space and art, right? So uh, this is an example where s space science meets art and audio. Yeah, you got a musical note in there as well. <laughs> A sharp. Yeah, you can see that. 
F3, E5. I can play it again if you like. Yeah. So um, plenty of artists out there have taken uh, Pulsar data and put them in songs and recordings and whatnot. And um, before I show that, uh, different Pulsars have different pulse shapes and morphologies. You have uh, features like giant pulses, uh, pulse drifting and uh, pulse nulling. So it's like a zoo of shapes out there. And uh, this is actually the album cover of uh, Unknown Pleasures by the English rock band Joy Division. Joy Division. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually, these are actually Pulsar Pulse profiles from CP 1919, the first ever Pulsar discovered by Jocelyn Bell, which she won the Nobel Prize for back in, yeah, originally it was awarded to Anthony Hewish, and then people went back and uh, they decided to give it to her. <laughs> So uh, from left to right on this image right here is like one turn of the pulsar. So as the pulsar is turning, it will like spike and then it will go down and then it'll spike again. So by stacking these plots, you're like multiple subsequent turns. And you can actually interestingly see there's some uh, variations in the shape throughout the, the rotational phase. There's different variations of the pulse profiles. So that was some really awesome pop culture and artistic visual aspect of pulsars. Now, uh, if I have time, I'd like to talk about the contribution of pulsars towards improving our understanding of natural laws of physics of the universe, which is really what gives physicists a reason to wake up in the morning. And uh, pulsars are good for a lot of things. Pulsar rotation can be used to measure time more precisely than atomic clocks. Uh, pulsars can be used to navigate aircraft as an alternative to GPS. Uh, here's a little tangent that I like to go on. Uh, the Golden Voyager record that was put on the Voyager spacecraft has this little scratchy symbol right here. And this is actually um, an etching that describes the location of our solar system in the center relative to 14 pulsars uh, in the galaxy. And the hope is that if any intelligent uh, aliens might discover the Voyager spacecraft, they'll be able to deduce our location by looking at these etchings because these etchings have the period of the pulsar and you can actually localize your position in the galaxy by looking at something by looking at different pulsars and there has been research recently of uh, aircraft navigation based on pulsars so there's there's a lot to to get from studying these things and studying them is only about 60 years of research so you wonder where we might end up to next uh Love yeah will tear us apart Sorry? Love will tear us apart. Is that a lyric from a song? Joy Division. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I thought so. <laughs> yeah, um, so this is the big science project that is attempting to be done with pulsars. Uh, it's called the Pulsar Timing Array. It's a method to detect low frequency gravitational waves from colliding supermassive black holes somewhere in the universe. You might be familiar with this image that was produced last year. And the idea is that somewhere in the universe, a pair of these monsters are colliding with each other. And that produces ripples in space time called gravitational waves. And um, the idea is that by looking at pulsars, observing pulsars and measuring the arrival time of their signals relative to different pulsars, we can actually detect the ripples produced by colliding supermassive black holes. And the German physicist, uh, Michael Kramer, calls it strong field tests of general relativity. Um, we've done tests for relativity in our own solar system by bouncing radio waves off of celestial bodies and measuring their return times. We've tested relativity by sending satellites up into orbit, such as uh, Gravity Probe B in the first decade of, first decade of this century. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading off a script here. Uh, and now we want to probe relativity to its extreme limits. And these extreme limits exist at the event horizon of a black hole, which is this incredible boundary space that veils the true singularity that lies beyond. And currently we don't have any sensible laws of physics to make sense of singularities and event horizons because uh, Einstein's theories kind of break down at that point. We don't even know if such laws of physics exist, although it would be nice to find out. 
and um, gravitational waves as an astrophysical messenger, as an astrophysical carrier of information, will allow us to better understand black holes. Since light cannot escape the event horizon, perhaps gravitational waves will be able to give us a better picture of what's going on. So it's not like we're enhancing a picture where it's more like being able to listen to what the black hole is doing when two of them collide. They emit these gravitational waves and that's the signature of this extreme physics happening somewhere out there in the universe. Um, pulsar timing arrays should allow us to do this. Uh, and the, the, the production of gravitational waves was a prediction made by Einstein in 1915 and 1916, which was later verified by uh, LIGO. And um, I'm gonna, this is LIGO right here, which is, um, you may see some similarities between this image and this image. And that similarity is the L-shaped arms, right? We're essentially measuring the distances of the arms. And then if any, gravitational waves pass by, it should cause the distances in the arms to change. So it's simply at different lengths. And this instrument was used to detect uh, gravitational waves from stellar mass black holes, this one from supermassive black holes. Um, so yeah, where do, I f where do I fit in into all of this? That's me at my desk. Pardon for the mess, pardon me for the mess. Um, that's where I do my science. Uh, but we recently moved to a different office here in Auckland. Um, simply put, this is what I do. In this one image is explains uh, my entire experiment. And as the pulsar signal travels towards us, it's scattered and delayed by in the interstellar medium by things such as free electrons and magnetic fields. And this really throws off the timing measurements that we want to use to detect the gravitational waves. And I'm using the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa uh, and some algorithms such as the 2D Fourier transform, uh, cross correlations, image processing, and a pinch of statistical analysis. And I'm attempting to uh, probe this gas cloud, this interfering gas cloud, in order to better compensate for the noise that they create in the pulsar timing measurements. So I'm doing this with the help of a next generation supercomputer in Australia called OSTAR, without which it would be impossible to analyze the data of the Meerkat. And uh, this practice of analyzing such large big data from the Meerkat is transferable towards improving the performance of high-speed data networks, such as the internet that we all know and love. Now, interestingly enough, Meerkat is the, uh, is the precursor to a, a coming telescope called the Square Kilometer Array which is uh, the largest radio telescope in the world under construction. It, it is currently under construction right now. So look that up, square kilometer array. It's really interesting stuff. So I wanted to show, uh, next few slides are really just my, some of the data artifacts that I deal with. These things are called dynamic spectrum. And essentially what it is, is the intensity, the brightness of the pulsar across frequency on the horizontal axis and time on no, time on the horizontal axis and frequency on the vertical axis. Uh, this, this is the high frequency plot right here, and that's taken at 1.3 to 1.5 gigahertz. Uh, this is the mid frequency that's taken at 950 megahertz to 1.1 gigahertz. And uh, this small plot right here is, a, is at 856 to 950 megahertz. So I think uh, relative to our friend, um, Maxim, was it Maximilian? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, we are at UHF and L band. So all of our observations at, are at UHF and L band, if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to show this plot right here. Um, this is an example of what satellites can do to our observations. You see these black streaks that run horizontally on the image. And that's example of uh, GSM towers, uh, the occasional satellite flying overhead, and um, occasionally microwave ovens. <laughs> when someone's cooking in a microwave, uh, it's a funny story. At, at an observatory once, someone was cooking in the microwave and uh, around lunchtime, they'd always detect an astronomical signal and they thought they found something significant, but it turns out that someone was uh, cooking at that time. Yeah. Um, Beyond that, I, I'm actually also a storyteller. I make videos and I talk about science and space. Um, 
follow me on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. My name is Afik Abdul Hamid. I hope I did not go over time and I hope my message was clear. Thank you very much. And I'll see you guys. Any questions? Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Afik. Yeah. How many new, uh, pulses are you looking at right now? Uh, at my stage, I'm only looking at the one, uh, J0437 minus 4715. And that's for a bit of astronomy information, that's right ascension and declination. That's how you find it. Like, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, J0437 is a millisecond pulsar. So it's spin period, like its period is within some milliseconds. Milliseconds, and, yeah. So does um, that mean it, it's harder to actually determine its actual period? Uh, because um, the, because uh, you, you mentioned the gas clouds. Uh, yeah. Uh, just now, yeah. That's that. Yeah. Yeah, because the um, uh, the period is in milliseconds, yeah. So uh, I can imagine it, it will be harder to um, accurately oh, yeah. determine the period, yeah. We're just, um, for my study, we're just looking at um, intensity of the source. So that's in uh -huh. gens, watts per meter square per hertz. Uh, we just mm -hmm. brightness, the radio brightness of the source. But the significance of millisecond uh, pulsars is that they're the best <laughs> for timing. Their timing is much more stable than the newly born pulsars with uh -huh. a few seconds of um, period. Yeah. All right. So uh, millisecond pulsars are born from like binary systems. Uh -huh. So an old pulsar essentially has to eat another star and uh -huh. know, treat matter off of the companion. And this will speed it up. And uh, because of conservation of angular momentum, it, it has yep. its rotational rate will just go yeah. much higher. But when we say a, a star is dying or a star is dead, what actually happened? What is, what, what is actually a star's soul? I mean, well, <laughs> if, if a star is dead, then what does it yeah. not have? <laughs> um, live, we like to think of um, living, living <laughs> stars yeah. on the main sequence as the ones that burn hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen yeah. into, uh, is it lighter or heavier elements? But there's all the way up until iron, and then it reaches this limit called the Chandrasekhar limit. And yeah. that's the process inside the star becomes adiabatic and uh, the, the fusion uh, releasing heat versus gravity going in, uh, at that point, gravity starts to win and the, car, the star collapses in on itself. And for stars at 10 to 20 times solar masses, it becomes pulsars. Greater than 20 solar masses, it becomes the stellar mass black holes that uh, collide to produce the gravitational waves LIGO detected in 2015. Okay. That's very interesting because... Uh... I've always interested in astronomy, but I ended up in aerospace engineering. <laughs> so, we're, okay, we're thank you very much. Apart. Yeah, <laughs> we are not. not okay, <laughs> all right. Yep. Okay, all right. With that, I would like to thank you, um, Afik, because I think we got uh, uh, our presenters in. Um, I think uh, Hanani is here, yeah? So Hanini is here, mm -hmm. but um, I think I'm going to um, give the next um, uh, presentation space to uh, Zainal Abidin Ghazali dengan tajuknya. Sebab dia dah, rasanya dari, dari tadi dia ada di sini. Uh, tajuknya no, Angkasa I... Belia dan Radio Amatur. So, alright. Terima kasih Hanani. Uh, so, Encik Zainal Abidin ada di sini, ya? Eh? Okay, thank you, everyone. Eh, hey, alright, yeah, thank you very much, Shafiq. Hope you stays around if, um, ataupun layan Facebook lah. I think probably uh, there, are, there are some questions there. I still cannot access the Facebook live. Probably, uh, Fikri, ada question ke soalan dari Facebook live? No For now, no yet. No yet. <laughs> okay, all right. So, thank you from Kuala Lumpur, Afik. Kuala Lumpur to Auckland. <laughs> I think okay. Max have a question. It seems that you oh, were yeah, on Max? the meeting. 
If oh, I can shoot, yeah. Uh, uh, short yeah, question. Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, uh, while waiting for our next presenter, yeah. Since you were already uh, mentioning it earlier during my talk, and thanks for your very visual presentation, um, how do you deal with those interferences? Uh, there has been, like, my approach was to do uh, machine learning, uh, convolutional neural networks. But a lot of the pre-existing approaches uses um, statistics, interquartile range. Um, basically, we flag the channels, and then for my, and then we fill it with linear interpolation for for my data. But um, really, the challenge is to figure out um, how much RFI should we mitigate to call it a good job. You know, sh the more we throw away the image, the more channels we mitigate the the less our signal to noise ratio. So that's the Absolutely. big challenge there. Yeah. And what's your vision for, for the future? Uh, if more LMS kind of come in with uh, more than 20 or 30,000 satellites up there? Yeah, smarter algorithms, more compute time. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I would say that it is becoming a serious problem. Uh, in my data, I have these horizontal streaks uh, everywhere. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, no wonder they hate us. Yeah, also I, I could see a clear line of 900 something megahertz. I think that's all the remote controls for uh, your aircon and so on. That's also a very yeah. straight line, yeah. Some of them are quite persistent, like those channels always have RFI, while others are intermittent. Mm. What's for you better to deal with? Um, I can just flag the persistent ones manually, but the intermittent ones uh, are because it's a time um, series. Changes over time, time variant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Sure.